Hey, everybody. Welcome into the podcast. We are back with another special bonus episode. Bonus episode. We are going to continue our series that we just started called How to Cocktail. The last time we did this, we talked about the old fashioned. And today we're going to talk about my personal favorite whiskey cocktail, the Rob Roy. Now, for those of you who've never heard of the Rob Roy, it is essentially a Manhattan that is made with scotch instead of with rye or bourbon. You know, the whole point of us doing this series, Brad, is that we want to give people, you know, maybe five, six basic whiskey cocktails that they can make at home. Because I'm not really a mixologist. I know that you went to bartending school, but we we typically prefer our whiskeys neat. But every once in a while, you want to try something different. You want to try a cocktail. And so we're keeping it really simple with some of the most popular whiskey cocktails there are. And today that means we're moving into the world of Manhattans and Rob Roy's. Well, and when you start with the Manhattan Bob, like it's one of the most classic drinks out there. And it's such a simple recipe, which is why I think it's so famous for bartenders, for people to drink. You know, it's literally just rye whiskey, sweet vermouth and bitters. Yeah, that's it. And that's it. Like it's so it's such an easy drink. Now, obviously, as as we do with everything here in America, it becomes a melting pot. You can make it with bourbon. You can make it with other types of whiskeys. Um, but the classic Manhattan is with rye and the Rob Roy. All you do is you change out that rye for some scotch. Yeah, it's a really, really simple cocktail. I like it because it's not artificially sweetened in any way. You're not adding any sort of simple syrup. You're not adding honey or any, you know, like a super fine sugar to this. It's literally just the flavors of the scotch, the vermouth and the bitters. And you garnish it with a cherry. It is like it could not get more simple than this. And what we're going to do is we're going to break down each component of the Rob Roy today as we make it and kind of talk about the backstory of it as well. So, Brad, are you ready to get into drinking a Rob Roy? I am all about it, Bob. Have you ever had a Rob Roy before uh, I I told you that this was the drink I wanted to do for this podcast? Bob, I've I've actually never even had a Manhattan. Oh, interesting. Yeah, the Manhattan has been like the, the swanky drink of choice for whiskey drinkers for well over a century now. The Rob Roy, as Brad said, is basically the same drink as a Manhattan. You're just swapping it for scotch. Uh, And it had its origin in New York City. Uh, It actually was invented in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, one of the most famous hotels in the world, uh, at its original location on Fifth Avenue. It was right smack dab in the middle of Broadway. And in the late 1800s, there was a Broadway play that was being shown called Rob Roy about the famous Scottish hero. And so the hotel invented a cocktail to go along with this show. And they that was actually a common practice back then. All the hotels and bars in the Broadway area would kind of come up with their own cocktail to coincide with the premiere of a new show to try to drive some business and have kind of a tie in. And this drink just stuck. And it's still with us well over 100 years later. And I think for good reason. Bob, I think that what I hear you saying is that we need to create a film and whiskey themed cocktail absolutely that is unique to us well i feel like i have to get the rob roy down before i can start branching out on my own brad because (laughs) this this three ingredient cocktail took took all of my concentration to make i mean you do have a very small brain i don't fault you for it (laughs) uh but yeah the rob roy it's a it's a really fun drink to make it's it's such a simple drink we're excited to share it with you today we are using a scotch called scotch me um it's a blended malt scotch Bob, why don't you tell our listeners a little more about Scotch Me? Yeah, so Scotch Me is a a fairly new company. Uh, They found us on Instagram, and uh, we've been having a conversation. And I said, hey, do you guys send samples out? We'd love to try Scotch Me. They sent us a sample. It is a blended malt scotch. And what that means is that it is a blend of many different single malt scotches. So it is totally comprised of malted barley from many different distilleries and all blended together. Scotch Me is actually blending together whiskeys from over 20 distilleries in the Speyside and Highland regions of Scotland. This particular scotch is aged for at least four years. It clocks in at 88.8 proof, which is pretty pretty well in line with what you would find in the world of scotch. You don't find a ton of barrel-proof scotches out there. And I actually think this is a perfect proof point for making a Rob Roy. I think this is going to blend really, really well into our Rob Roy. But before we mix it with a bunch of other ingredients... Brad, what are you picking up on the nose and taste of this Scotch Me Scotch? Man, on the nose of this, I'm getting a little, a little bit of that sweetness um, that you would expect from a non-peated uh, Scotch. There's not really any of that peat going on here, um, but it, it's got some really nice sweet notes. Uh, there's a little bit 
of almost like a flowery kind of dandelion smell to it. It's a little bit earthy. Um, it's it's an interesting scotch. There There's some stuff on the nose that intrigues me. Yeah, it's a very bright scotch. And it doesn't say anything about being aged in sherry casks, but it has that sort of nice uh, whiny character to the nose. On the taste, it's very sweet, and it has a really kind of roasty, toasty flavor to it, which is obviously the malted barley, but it tips away from being super scotchy and more into that kind of comfortable range of really sweet and really toasty. And I really appreciate that. It's almost like a uh, like a honeyed oat kind of flavor. I'm really enjoying this, and I think it's going to mix really, really well with our cocktail. Yeah, there's certain there's certain whiskeys out there that are great on their own, but they just work beautifully in a in a mixed drink. Um, and I think Scotch Me might be one of those brands. Well, Brad, I think we have delayed long enough. It is time to build ourselves a Rob Roy. So uh, you're the bartender here. Do you want to walk us through what it looks like to build this drink from the ground up? Yeah, so anytime you start off building a drink, you want to read through the entire recipe. You want to see where you're putting the drink, if you're straining it, kind of what you're doing. The, the Rob Roy doesn't have to be built in a strainer. You know, that that is the fun way to make it. And, I, you know, I don't know if it changes the quality a ton. You can just make it right in your glass if you really want to. Absolutely. Um, but, it's a, but it's a drink that you make chilled um, and then you pour it into your glass. You're going to use two ounces of scotch. I think it's fine if you want to use a blended or a single malt whiskey. Uh, my advice with the Rob Roy would be probably avoid anything that's super peaty. Um, when you get into that really, really peaty stuff, it just so easily overwhelms any other flavor going on um, that using it for a mixed drink. I, I don't know, Bob, have you ever used a, a heavily peated scotch for a Rob Roy? Yeah. So I actually made one today with Laphroaig just to see what it would be like with a peated scotch. And and it does. I mean, the the smoke overwhelms everything else. I'm sure that there are people out there who really like that. But if this is your first time trying a Rob Roy, I would recommend something non-peated. You know, you could even just go with your standard like a J&B or a Dewar's or if you want to pick up a bottle of Monkey Shoulder. I think those would all be phenomenal mixers for your Rob Roy. But try to avoid something that is really, really smoky flavored. Yeah, even like a, a Glen Morangy, they're, you know, they're basic things like that, sure. I, you know, I think are all good, good options. So you start with your two ounces of scotch, you throw it on in, and then you add an ounce of sweet vermouth. Uh, a lot of recipes that you'll see out there say three quarters of an ounce. And you might be asking yourself, Brad, what, you know, what does the difference of a quarter of an ounce make? I honestly think it makes a, di a big difference. When you only have that three quarters of an ounce, you don't get quite as much flavor from the vermouth. Um, so I think it's worth it. Just go a whole one ounce of the sweet vermouth. Add your two to three dashes of bitters. And if you want to know more about bitters, at the end of this episode, we have a spectacular interview um, with Andrea Latimer, the owner of Bitter Lab um, out in Utah. So if you want to know more about bitters, you're going to hear more later. So don't worry about it. But you're going to add two to three dashes of bitters. Um, you're going to garnish it with a brandied cherry. If you don't have a brandy cherry, go ahead and use a maraschino cherry. It's right, okay. Right. We, we can all be peasants together. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if we're talking about the classic way to make this drink, you put it in a mixing glass, which is basically just a fancy beaker. You stir it with ice. They recommend stirring it so that you don't get a ton of dilution from shaking it. Because when you shake a drink with ice, uh, it makes the ice melt way faster. And you're trying to kind of keep the components of this drink together. Take that mixing glass. You strain it into a coupe glass. This is what it's traditionally served in. A coupe glass is like if you've ever seen that uh, gif of Leonardo DiCaprio from The Great Gatsby toasting people, that's that's a coupe glass. It's what they used to serve champagne in before the flute came along. And it's used primarily for cocktails now. You could use a martini glass. You could use a Nick and Nora glass if you have that. Honestly, if you want to put this in a rocks glass, you can. But traditionally, if you go to a bar and you order a Rob Roy, you're going to get it in a coupe glass. I was going to say, we know that we are in the postmodern 2020 world when you're using GIFs to describe, you know, uh, <laughs> drinkware. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and, and if you want to get even more traditional about it, I've seen this recipe specifically called for using a chilled coupe glass. And I don't know about you, Brad, but I don't have a ton of room in my refrigerator uh, for chilling glasses. But it does help to keep the drink chilled for a longer period of time, which will help kind of lock those flavors in a little bit better. If you want to chill your glass, you can put it in the freezer for about five minutes, or you could just give it a quick chill as you're mixing the drink 
uh, by filling it with water and crushed ice and then dumping that right before you pour the drink in it. Now, again, this is like if you want to get super fancy with it and you're not just drinking it out of a plastic cup that you got from going to a baseball game five years ago. So if you are using a mixing glass to do this, or if you're just dumping from one vessel into another, make sure you don't pour the ice into your glass. Uh, this cocktail is served up. That's the terminology for it. And when you talk about a cocktail that's served up, what that means is that it's mixed with ice to chill it, but then it's served without ice. So when you order this at a bar, it's going to come to you in a glass with no ice in it, but it will be chilled down. And uh, I'm just happy to know some some lingo now. So I know that that's called up. Bob, you're learning it all, man. I'm proud of you. <laughs> The here's the thing, unless you go to like some of the higher end bars, if you're just going to your local bar and you said like, oh, they said, oh, do you want it like on the rocks? Be like, oh, I'll take it up. I'll bet you a lot of bartenders wouldn't know what that means, which which might be unfortunate, but that's just kind of it is, is what it is. But that's Brad, if I can offer any life advice to our listeners. That's why you don't go to Applebee's for a cocktail. Do you know what I mean? That's why you go to Applebee's for the dollar Rita. You don't go for a Rob Roy. That's right. For your $5 beer and burger combo. <laughs> so the Rob Roy can actually be made a ton of different ways, just like with a Manhattan, just like with something like a martini. So if you really want this to be a little bit sweeter, which sometimes I do, if you're going to be using a cherry to garnish this with, just take a bar spoonful of the juice or the syrup from the maraschino cherry or the luxardo cherry jar that you're using and put that in there with the cherry. It really does add a little bit of a, you know, a sweetness component if if the scotch and vermouth are not sweet enough for you. This can also be served on the rocks, like Brad said. You know, it, it really is up to you how you want to make this drink. One of the things that you kind of have to have in your Rob Roy, though, is vermouth. And I'm not going to lie, Bob, for the longest time, I had literally no idea what vermouth was. I wasn't sure if it was some sort of clear, you know, liquor or a liqueur. Bob, can you tell our, our listeners what vermouth is? Yeah, absolutely. So vermouth is what's called a fortified wine, which basically means that it's like wine that's been spiked with brandy. It's wine that has a neutral spirit added to it. Um, so it's it's a wine that is kind of kicked up a notch by some extra spirit, and it's infused with a bunch of herbs and spices. This is an alcoholic beverage that is kind of native to Italy and to France. And so when you go to the store and you see vermouth on the shelf in those little pint bottles, you'll see one marked sweet, and it typically will have like a red cap or a red label, and one marked dry. The sweet ones are typically from Italy. The dry ones are typically from France, and they use wormwood kind of as their base ingredient. I do not have a lot of experience with dry vermouth because I prefer to make drinks that have sweet vermouth in them. And that's what the Rob Roy uses. So sweet vermouth really came into vogue like in the late 1800s, especially in places like New York City where this drink was invented because Italian immigrants were kind of pouring into New York City at that time. And they were bringing their liquor with them. And so they were bringing vermouth and vermouth was kind of experiencing a boom in America. And so bartenders started using it. And that's how we get the Manhattan. That's how we get the Rob Roy because of Italian immigrants bringing that drink with them, you know, into the new world. So again, because this is basically like a, a fortified or like a alcohol strengthened wine, it's not as alcoholic as an actual liquor. So it's nowhere near the proof point of the scotch or the rye that you would be using for a Rob Roy or a Manhattan. It almost acts as like an intermediary between your liquor and your bitters. It's right in that proof point of, you know, 25 to 30 proof where it's adding flavor, it's adding some sweetness, and it's kind of bringing in a few of those herbal elements that you're also going to get kind of punched up a notch with the bitters that you add. Well, and that and Bob, that takes us to our final ingredient in the Rob Roy, which is the bitters. Bitters originally are, they're kind of a liquor that are heavily flavored with like herbs and plants. Um, honestly, the start of them is fascinating. They, they started to be used for medicinal purposes back in like ancient Egypt, where they would infuse wine with herbs to give it this heavily strong, bitter flavor. Um, and, you know, they believe that it would, would help them in, with their maladies and illnesses. So nowadays, the beautiful thing about bitters is we often think about like Angostura bitters and it's just kind of like, oh, that's the generic brand that you buy. Well, the really cool thing is there are some companies out there that are changing up the bitters game. A few weeks ago for our first How to Cocktail episode, we used the bitter bottle um, in our cocktails, had a great experience with them. 
And we are about to have an interview with a friend of theirs, another bitters company called the Bitters Lab. Yeah. So, Brad, I don't know about you, but like even after talking about how important bitters are to a cocktail, like I, I don't really know a lot about bitters. I know that you use them in cocktails. But other than that, like I don't exactly know what function they serve. I don't know a lot about how they're made, why they're important. And so we actually have partnered up with the Bitters Lab, a company in Salt Lake City, Utah, and they are going to be our official bitters provider, I think, from here until the end of the podcast. And we sat down with Andrea Latimer, who is the owner at the Bitters Lab, to do a quick interview about why bitters are important to your Rob Roy and to all of your whiskey cocktails. So let's listen in. All right, so we are joined today by Andrea Latimer. She is the founder and owner of Bitters Lab in Salt Lake City, Utah. Andrea, I, I apparently found out about our podcast because we had worked with the Bitter Bottle in Chattanooga, and there, there's some sort of underground network of bitters companies across the country that are that are hyping our podcast right now. So <laughs> Andrea actually reached out to us and offered to send us some samples. I opened my door the other day and found a gigantic package on my porch, which contained everything that the bitters lab actually sells. I think I got 10 different kinds of bitters. So I sent a message over to Andrea and said, I hope you're prepared to be the official bitters sponsor of the film and whiskey podcast, because I don't think we'll ever need to go to another company. So Andrea, first of all, congratulations on playing the long game and, and becoming part of the film and whiskey podcast from here to eternity. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So we were perusing your website a little bit for the Bitters Lab, and I'm so fascinated with your story, your backstory. It says that you started out as a cake designer and that you really kind of had this, this impulse that you wanted to start making natural flavorings uh, for baked goods that didn't have any of the artificial sweeteners or anything like that. Can you just talk a little bit about how you moved from basically being, you know, a, a cake designer into an entrepreneur who is solely kind of manufacturing bitters? Yeah, I actually got my start in using bitters, um, making old fashions at home. I was a cake designer at the time. I had been, I owned a cake wedding cake business for about uh, seven years. And it was really close to the end of this that I got really into making cocktail bitters. So I was making my own extracts for my cakes. Um, and then when I started, you know, messing around with old fashions at home, I realized that bitters were basically more extreme, more concentrated, more flavor forward, and more interesting and complex than just standard, you know, uh, vanilla flavorings or mint or whatever. So I started using those in my cakes, cookies, pies. And then I knew that, you know, I kind of wanted to, to transition out of the wedding industry because it wasn't super exciting. Um, <laughs> it's a little stressful being in the wedding industry. And uh, so I kind of decided to like close up the, the wedding cake business and try my hand at cocktail bitters in Salt Lake, which is a little crazy. We were the first cocktail bitters company here in Utah. Um, there's actually four here now, but we started out with a dessert stand at the farmer's market to kind of gauge the interest in, you know, our community here to see how interested people were. You know, that was in 2014. And at the end of that year, we had a really great season and had a lot of interest um, and decided to open Utah's first bitters company. I spent years developing recipes. And before we even began, I started making bitters in 2008. So, wow, man. Yeah, that's it's got to be so cool to see it come. You know, I mean, you're 12 years down the road. You guys have all sorts of bitters. Uh, I am kind of curious, though, like, you know, this is the film and whiskey podcast. Uh, at some point, though, we might need to be the film whiskey and bunt cake podcast because, like, I've never thought about using bitters in baking before. So tell me what that's like, um, how you can use bitters in baking and like, like, how did, how did you figure that out? Is that something you always knew that you could do? I am such a novice when it comes to this subject. 
Yeah, so it's actually a lot more simple than you'd think. It's really just because bitters are so similar to extracts, like vanilla extract, um, the main difference is, is that bitters contain anywhere from two ingredients or you know up to 30 or more ingredients. Um, mainly what really kind of makes the difference is the bittering agents that are in cocktail bitters versus extracts that just have plain flavor. So my general like rule when I'm talking to people is just use bitters in the exact same way that you, you, that you would use vanilla extract in a cake or a cookie recipe. I usually start out um, with a new flavor of bitters in a glaze or something that's going to have a lot, um, that's gonna kind of bring out the bitters flavors a little bit more. It's really, really easy to kind of make that transition from extracts to bitters. So kind of along those lines, I noticed that your website is kind of broken down into seasonal and year round bitters. And I have a feeling that kind of plays into the ingredients you're using, but could you explain to our listeners you know, why some are good for year round use and why some are only seasonal? So that's a great question. Um, so the reason we have seasonals is because we like to use local ingredients whenever possible, which means, you know, based on the seasons, we have four legit seasons here in Utah. And based on the season is when we can get sort of the most intense, deliciously flavored ingredients. For example, rhubarb and sea salt. That grows here locally. We work with a couple different farmers here and they grow really lovely, beautiful rhubarb, but they only have it for maybe a month, six weeks. Um, and once it's gone, it's gone. So we kind of like to keep the bitters in line with that. We release, you know, once we get the, for example, the rhubarb, once we get it, we make the batch, we release it. Once that batch is gone, it's gone until the following season. So that's really important to us to, you know, work with local uh, farmers and producers here in our state. And uh, we think it's really important to stay local and support the people in our community. So that's, that's the main reason for the seasonals. And Andrea has actually agreed to walk us through kind of a tasting of bitters, which is something that we've never done before. And we were talking with Andrea off air a little bit, and she mentioned that I think to the average consumer, bitters just kind of seems like a side ingredient that you just kind of dump into a cocktail because the recipe says to. But there's so much more going on with bitters than just that. And so I'm really excited. Andrea, can you walk us through this three-step tasting process of how to get acclimated to bitters before you start experimenting with them? Of course. Yeah. So as you just mentioned, it's important that you try them before you start experimenting just to get an idea of the flavors that are at play. And not everybody's familiar with what bittering agents are or what those flavors taste like. So experimenting with them is really important. Even if you can't pinpoint what you're trying, um, you'll at least have that flavor on your palate. And then you can kind of go from you know, tasting them to now I can experiment with this flavor because I know what it tastes like and I can, you know, decide if it's going to work in whiskey or mezcal or gin or, you know, whatever. Um, so let's start with the first step, which is the diluted method. So what you want to do is put two to four dashes of bitters in a glass with um, just a little bit of sparkling water. So you don't want a full glass of sparkling water. You just want a small amount um, maybe an ounce or so. Um, and the reason you want sparkling water is that the bubbles are actually going to awaken your taste buds or sort of like open up your palate and allow you to absorb the flavors that you're tasting a little bit more. Um, the bubbles are also going to, you know, release the aromatics in the bitters, which as you're going to take a sip, you'll get that on your nose as well. So the bubbles are really important here. Um, if you don't have sparkling water, you can use just plain water, but the bubbles are really going to play an important role. So, um, and then you just want to take a sip of that. So you don't want to down this. You don't want to shoot it. You're just going to sip it slowly like you would a nice whiskey so that you can really explore the flavors that you're tasting. Well, and if I could throw a quick question in there, I, this is something that I had to ask a long time ago. And I know a lot of people that are newer to mixed drinks have to ask how would you define a dash of bitters? That's a great question. A dash is different for everybody, but most cocktail bitters have what's called a reducer inside the neck of the bottle. So when you take the cap off, there's this little piece of plastic in there that has a hole in it. If you tip your bottle upside down completely and then just give it a shake or two, 
that's considered a dash. So it depends on how heavy handed you are. Um, your dash is going to be different than my dash is going to be different from, you know, someone else's dash. So a dash is like, it's like a pinch of salt or, you know, uh, a smidgen. That's kind of like the, the measurement category that it falls under. Um, another great way to sort of determine a dash is if you have a dropper bottle, um, a full sleeve of your dropper bottle is considered a dash of bitter. So that for some people, a lot of people prefer the dropper just because it's a little easier to control. But that's that's kind of the gist of it. I hope that helps explain a little bit what a yeah. Dash no, that's that is super. That's super helpful. I think it's easy to read recipes and you go a dash of that. I what's a dash even? And the answer seems to be it's what you want it to be. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, Andrea, can you walk us through step two of this method? Yes. Okay. So the next method is very easy. You don't need any special tools for this. Um, this is called the direct method and it's just a drop on the back of your hand and then you're going to lick it off. So this is direct. There's no interference with any other ingredients. This is going to give you probably a bit more alcohol forward. The bitterness is going to be much more intense. Um, and then depending on the flavor that you're trying, you'll probably, you know, if you're for example, our habanero lime, if you try it in the sparkling water versus direct, you're getting a lot more of the spiciness trying it direct than you are in the water because you're, you know, diluting it. So there's, there's a major difference in flavor and, um, you know, aroma that you're kind of getting from the water versus the direct method. Even just hearing the names of these bitters, I, I hope our audience is understanding that the bitters lab can take your cocktail experience, not even to the next level, but like beyond the next level. Like you're throwing habanero lime in there. Like you, you better put your big boy pants on. We got some, we got some stuff for you there. <laughs> yeah. We don't mess around, I guess. <laughs> well, that makes me a little nervous then about what step three of this process might be. Um, I think Brad, you know, might be hinting at the fact that we're just going to guzzle this straight out of the bottle. <laughs> I would not recommend, um, although, you know, it's, it's been known Pe people, people drink bitters straight. You can mix like an ounce of bitters in a cocktail, which is a lot, but it's, it's been done, but I would not recommend drinking it straight. Uh, we are going to, this next process is actually a smell technique and not a taste. So we're going to put a drop or two in the palm of our hand, and then you want to rub that together until it's completely dissolved. And then you take your hands over your nose and your mouth, just kind of cup it over your nose and your mouth and inhale. So what the warming or what the rubbing um, of the bitters together in your hands are doing is basically releasing sort of any sweeter notes. So if there's vanilla, if there's, you know, sweet notes from any of the bittering agents, which you'll sometimes get that like the warming it up between your hands is going to release those. Yeah, and I've done this this process, the three-step process now with two of your bitters. The first was the fig and walnut, the second was the aromatic. And especially with the aromatic, I think this this process is so eye-opening and enlightening because it was like three completely different takes on the exact same product. You know, you had it at its most concentrated, you had it diluted, and then, you know, just on the nose on my hands, it's like candy sweet. It's it's just so interesting to see how much complexity there is in a product like an aromatic bitters. And Andrea, before we let you go, I, I really would love for you to tell our audience about this awesome thing you have on your website called the Bitters Lab Club. Oh, sure. Um, so the Bitters Lab Club is a subscription service that uh, we release new flavors each quarter, so four times a year, and it, they come out with each new season. So they're aligned with the equinox or the solstice so they'll come out on whatever date that falls and we change the flavors up every time so we're never repeating a flavor you receive a two ounce bottle of whatever we feel like doing and recipe cards for a cocktail a food item and then a dessert and then being a part of the club also has other perks uh, you get discounts on shop items so our seasonals that we kind of touched on before and then any sort of workshops that we do. So we normally hold in-person classes, but obviously due to COVID and those sort of issues, we're not doing that right now, but we have been doing virtual classes. So that includes, you know, discounts on virtual classes. Um, and then each quarter, once we release a new flavor, we actually invite all of our club members to join us in a class, which they're virtual. So a virtual class where we 
teach you a cocktail. We talk about the bitters. We'll do a food item. We'll do a dessert. Um, so this was kind of a way for me to basically experiment with new flavors, kind of test the market, see how, you know, interested people were in, you know, like hibiscus and yuzu. That's something really interesting and unique. I've never seen bitters like that before. And if it seems like it's really popular, then we sort of will turn it into maybe a seasonal or a standard flavor. So that happened with our rhubarb and sea salt that actually started out as a bitters lab club flavor. And now is one of our spring seasonals that we release each March. No, Andrea, it sounds like there's just so many amazing ways to connect with your company and and not just to connect with what you guys are doing, but to experience the flavor and the taste that you guys have to offer over at the Bitters Lab. I, I mean, it's just been wonderful to have you on today. Uh, what What's your Instagram page? Go ahead and plug. Where can people find you? Yeah, so it's bitterslab.com is our website and uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter are all just at Bitters Lab. Well, Andrea, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for becoming the official bitters of the Film and Whiskey podcast. We look forward to trying all 10 of these flavors that you sent over the next 40 years. So uh, we are we are so, so excited. And it's so great to talk to you. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed talking to you guys. Well, Film and Whiskey Nation, we just had so much fun talking to her. Something that she said right after we finished the interview and stopped recording was that bitters are there to give your mixed drinks a backbone. And I, I think that that's like the perfect way to sum it up. That, you know, when you want something unique and fun and interesting, that you have this opportunity to not just turn to the traditional, normal, generic bitters but that you can try something out like the Bitters Lab and all of the fascinating flavors that they have. And man, you are set. You get to share it with your friends. Uh, it, it's just such an awesome way to experience a mixed drink. I really can't recommend them highly enough. Yeah, we definitely want to thank Andrea at the Bitters Lab. And Brad, I want to thank you for letting me introduce our listeners to my favorite whiskey cocktail, the Rob Roy. I really want to hear listener feedback. If you are at home and you make this drink for yourself, you mix this up, please let us know what you think of it. You can find us on social media, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, at Film Whiskey. Or you can give us a call. Our phone number is 216-800-5923. Once again, that is 216-800-5923. You also have an opportunity to let your voice be heard by recording it on our Anchor.fm webpage. Go to anchor.fm slash film whiskey, record a message, and we would love to play it here on the podcast. We'll be back on Monday with another regularly scheduled episode. But until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time.